T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Welcome to JumbleThink, where we interview dreamers, makers, innovators, and influencers all about their journey of turning dreams and ideas into reality. Along the way, we're going to share some tips on how you can turn your own dreams and ideas into reality, too. Our guest on today's episode is Twyla True. More about Twyla in a moment. Whether you're a longtime fan or a new listener, if you've never subscribed to JumbleThink, there's never a better time to do it than right now. Head on over to wherever you listen to podcasts, search for JumbleThink, and click subscribe. To make it even easier, if you head on over to jumblethink.com, you'll find many of the popular places to listen to podcasts listed there with a link so you can go subscribe. Go do it. Subscribe right now to JumbleThink and never miss another amazing conversation. Now let's jump into today's conversation. Hey there, friends. Welcome to Jumble Think. My name's Michael Woodward. I am your host, and I know it's been a while. It's been a couple months since we've released an episode. There is a lot going on in my world, in our family's world, a lot of really cool and new uh, adventures that we're going to be going on. I'm going to be updating you on that in a couple of weeks in a new episode, but we have a bunch of episodes that we've been recording over the last few months that I'm going to be sharing with you first. We are inching towards episode 400 and and we have some great conversations that are going to get us to that episode 400 mark on the show today our guest is twyla true and this is going to be a really fun episode she is a serial entrepreneur starting some really really cool things we're going to be talking about all those businesses she was also named one of entrepreneur magazine's 100 women of impact this year and one of success magazine's 2022 Women of Influence. This is a powerful episode. We're going to learn a lot about ideas and creating business and a lot more. So let's go ahead and join today's conversation with our guest, Twyla True. Twyla, thank you for joining us here on Jumble Think. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Now, we have lots of entrepreneurs on. We've had actors. We've had Olympians. And it's interesting to see the the bio sheet that we get and then the research. And, And one of the things that stood out to me about you is just how incredibly invested you are into so many different things. Uh, You are uh, an entrepreneur. You have Volume Ventures, 1500 Sound Academy. You have True Family Enterprises, True Lane Homes. You have Twyla True Fine Jewelry, Twyla True Collaborations. And, And it doesn't just stop at those businesses. You're also a philanthropist and you have lots of other things that you focus on with the the True Sue Hope Foundation, the True Children's Home, and you're doing a lot. So before we dive into this, one of the things that I wanted to ask is, as an entrepreneur who is doing so much and believes in giving back, how do you sustain it all? Uh, you know, that's a great question. You you all, you don't know that you're always going to sustain it until you're there, you okay. know, so all those beginning fears and, and, you know, uh, what we think we can be and what we don't know it can be and all the scary stuff. It they're, they're all there. So yeah, that's what I got to tell you. You're, you're not there till you know, you're there. And, uh, and then, uh, you're, you're thankful and lucky. Yeah. So you are also, you have some accolades this year that are huge. You are entrepreneur magazines, 100 women of impact. You're on that list. You're also on success magazines, 2022 women of influence. So you've built a lot of credibility around your, what you're doing. I, I think that a lot of people think, oh, they're an entrepreneur or they do a lot of things that must mean that like nothing's really succeeding, but you have built a high level of success into everything that you do. Uh, so congratulations on those accolades and, and those, those mentions, because it's definitely well reserved or deserved as an entrepreneur, as a person that has gotten to a high level of success. How did you get into it? How did this all start for you? You know, um, I, I hear the word entrepreneur quite a bit now versus I'm 54 years old. I'm going to be 54 uh, in two days. So um, it's it's interesting because I if I kind of do like a throwback, you know, back in the 20s, 30s, 40s, you never really heard the word entrepreneur. You know, now yeah. you kind of hear it like like water. You know, it's it's very used out there. So I, I find it really interesting. Um, when I becoming an entrepreneur for me was really out of necessity, not. Uh, um, 
out of necessity that then a a potential sort of I wow these are things that I can do sort of happened. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, question was was how did I first start out in it? I first started out by really um, necessity working different positions. And um, I was not a person of means. My family wasn't a person of means. Um, in my sort of lifetime, you know, the only other way out for a female was uh, to marry. You know, you, that was usually what you did. You looked and, okay, there was high school, the, the prom, your first car, uh, maybe some, you know, went to college. But really the main focus here was who you're going to marry and, you know, kids. Um, I really didn't want that option. I wanted an additional option. That was sort of my plan C or D. That was if I failed <laughs> on my own. <laughs> I could always go, I could always go to that. So yeah, that was really how I started was uh, from need. Yeah. Well, happy birthday. I, I You mentioned this culture of you, you didn't come from much and you I, I'm assuming a lot wasn't expected of you that you would just kind of live the status quo life. How did you get into a, a mindset where you didn't want to accept that status quo, that, that this is the path that you're going to take. You're going to go find a husband. You're going to raise kids and, and tell us a little bit about that culture you grew into and how you overcame the mindset of that to create a new mindset for yourself. Yes. So as when, um, for my life, when I was, going through those developing years, uh, whatever your nearest memory is all the way to, I'll, I'll say my, the first time, my first uh, job running a company was at 27, 300 wow. people, Synthane Taylor in Laverne, creating computer circuit boards. Wow. For me, there was one thing and I had all of the, uh, I had all of the typical um, non-traditional family beginnings. So you know, I can, I can talk about poverty. I can talk about, um, you know, from a dysfunctional family, um, you know, all, all of those things were, but there was one thing that I had that I think that I was lucky. And the one thing I had was I had a few people in my life, grandmother and father adopted a father who adopted me, especially that, um, even though we were, you know, of the lower class or poor, I, I was the queen. Mm. I was so smart. You know, it doesn't, uh, I think the, the love of someone like a grandmother who just cherishes you and loves you is a gift. And that doesn't cost anything. Um, as a female, the gift of a man in my life, like my father, um, it doesn't matter if he was opening up his beat up Chevy truck and opening that door for me or a Rolls Royce. Wow. Um, you know, it, those things, if we were sitting in the parking lot and eating with a napkin on our lap, McDonald's, um, and he was, you know, just, and that was a reward for being on honor roll, you know, those things don't, don't really cost anything. And right. so those were the things that sort of set me apart. So that's, that's what, that was already in my head was that I'm, I'm great. There's all kinds of things that I can do. But now going from there in that reality, um, what were some of the hurdles I would say is when, then when I got out to other families and friends, I saw that I had a choice, you know, either I was going to have to figure this out and work for it and figure out how to get from here to there. It's just my, my distance was bigger than most, you know, my, yeah. my there was a lot further than if I had people, parents who had means, who weren't dysfunctional, if I was going to have an opportunity to higher education. So, okay, my distance was, was longer from here to there, but I could do it. That was always my mentality, is, was always that I could do it. Then um, when I had others come around me and, and I could see, well, you know, here's a different way to look at it. They, they uh, don't really do anything and feel, um, you know, the government will come in and help or, um, you know, what they're doing right now is satisfactory for them. And I think that's fantastic. It was just never satisfactory for me. And I wasn't holding my breath that, um, you know, marriage and a man or <laughs> the government was going to come and, and, you know, fix it all. I, I think I realized it was all on me. And I was okay with that because me was pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Now you mentioned 
uh, your your dad and your grandmother, it sounds like, you know, when we think of poverty in America today, we often think of not just poverty, but th- some of the things that go along with poverty, whether it's addiction or whether it's abuse. But it sounds like you had the blessing of coming from an, a, a, a community, uh, especially a family community that said, no, uh, we do value you. There is more to life. There is opportunity. Is that a fair assessment? Oh, that's very fair. So on my grandmother's side, she's a born uh, Oglala Lakota from Pine Ridge. So I'd go back to the reservation with her, um, you know, about every other summer and, you know, talk about seeing some poverty. You know, you, you definitely saw some poverty, but that wasn't identified. That's not an outsider would see poverty um, to my grandmother and to the tribe what you saw was uh, tribe love, uh, Mm. you saw culture, you saw value, um, you saw that a place that you belonged, um, you had kinship, you had those, all those great things. You definitely had, you know, they have the highest suicide rate in the country. Alcoholism is terrible. Um, Highest high school dropout rate, highest teenage pregnancy. Um, so you saw those things, but it, it, in some ways, seeing it also and, and knowing that those were also, again, my, my hurdle was high, but I could choose and that I could, you know, choose to uh, fight the statistic and just bring with it the part that was, um, that gave me strength. Yeah. Yeah. So for you, you didn't get into starting businesses and doing things right away. It sounds like for you, you got into the business world first. How Mm -hmm. did you get it pivot out of a place of not exactly having the means to being able to be in business and leading a company of 300 and and growing in those different roles? How did those stepping stones happen for you? So um, in school is where, in high school is where I found another sort of kinship uh, you know, they always say just a good teacher here and there. Yeah. It's a, a good uh, mentor here and there, a kind friends, parents, you know, that give you rides along with their kids to, to um, you know, musicals or things. So I had a few of those in my life and they're so, so important and so great to practice as, as it's our turn now. So I had some of those, but how I made the transition was I remember my very first job was at 16 years old uh, at Hot Dogs and More in um, in Anaha in uh, Arcadia Mall. Yeah, and I put on the rainbow hat. You know, I, I made the lemonade and I I, I served the hot dog, and um, it was always a learning experience for me. It was it was always that transition of transaction of okay, this is a store, this is a hot dog and lemonade. And the transaction of what was happening and, and uh, the monetary transaction, even in that, it, it never changes, whether it's a dollar hot dog, you know, or it's uh, one, of, one of our engagement rings or, you know, high roller emerald rings today, it doesn't matter. It's still a transaction. So I started off in the most simplest form, and then I just built from that and slowly took another job and took another job and just built. Wow. Well, did you ever make the the trek into college and getting a degree, or did you just continue on that path of entrepreneurship? Well, business and, and stepping into bigger roles and, and more um, opportunity through those. How did you get the knowledge behind Mm -hmm. those steps? Yes, so um, took some jobs. Each job got better because each job, your resume gets a little bit better. You go a little higher, a little higher. Then I hit uh, graduated high school and I didn't have the opportunity to be able to afford uh, college. By that time, I I was really supporting my parents. And so uh, went to school during the day and took some night classes at night, started out at PCC, um, you know, taking again, just night classes. So for me, whatever I did counted, you know, if I, I think for some, if you're, um, if, if it doesn't really have to count, then you can take a job that's fun. You know, you can, you can go to, if you're lucky enough, then you can go to school also and, you know, take all the general ed classes. And for me, everything had to count. So if I was working, it had to be a better pay than the last job. And I was learning something. 
And once I learned it, then I was off to the next one with better pay and a better position because that was my purpose. And then when I went to night school, I couldn't take classes that I enjoyed or interest me. I knew that I wanted to be self-sufficient um, financially. So if I was going to do that, I needed to learn how that hot, stop, hot dog stand made money. So I took accounting. Yeah. So we hear all the time, passion over and drive. You know, those are the kind of two buzzwords that we hear so often in entrepreneurship. Uh, are you passionate about it? Uh, are you driven to do it? Those kind of things. And yet it seems like you chose opportunity over passion, at least at the beginning of your mm -hmm. career to say, I'm going to get there someday to be able to build the things that, that I love. But to get there, I have to take things that I might not love as much, but they'll give me the lessons I need to learn. They'll give me the foundation I need. They'll give me the insights I need. Is that, am I hearing you right? You're absolutely accurate. I did a whole bunch of things at the beginning. I just hated <laughs> <laughs> accounting did not come easy, but I knew I had to understand uh, run. I knew that if I was going to run a business later, I had to do it with income statement in hand. Yeah. I had to understand, um, you know, what what net income was. What so everything that happens in accounting, I knew that I had to take the core business classes because every time you're sitting in a meeting, if when you know you don't know, then study those things that you don't know. So because what I didn't have a fear of also is is learning. I learned yeah. that. One of the biggest obstacles out there is, you know, they always say knowledge is power, but what does that mean? Yeah. You know, what it, knowledge is power means that it's it's powerful to you because it's a building block in your library mm -hmm. and you know more today than you did yesterday and nobody can take that away from you. However, um, hurdles in life and business, I found that uh, not everybody school wants to share knowledge from you, maybe with you, maybe a few mentors want to share knowledge with you, but lots of people in business do not. Yeah. Yeah. They do not because your ignorance is their gateway to a better position, um, you know, to, to the job that you want to the, and so uh, a lot of the stuff I, I learned learning on, even, even though I, maybe I didn't want to take that class Gosh, did I love it the next time I was in a meeting and somebody used an acronym and that acronym was not so scary. Wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> well, so, so, you know, I think often um, we undervalue the sense of curiosity along the journey. Was that a way that you were able to stay engaged? Like what kept you going when you're working in a job or you're studying accounting or you're looking into something that you're like, I know I need this but I don't like it right now. What kept you consistent through that process? Um, I think, as I said, knowing that I wanted to move up. So um, let's say I, hot, you know, I say, hate to say hot dogs, but I love to say it because everybody can start there. Yeah. And then night school uh, or night school and then classes. I mean, I took jobs at like UPS. And so all of these that were stepping stones, stepping stones. So being able to take a stepping stone and that resume to say, okay, I have experience and I have that peppered with a little bit of education. Yeah. So I, the mix of the two is extremely powerful if you've yeah. got both. And then every time I would sort of plateau here and there thinking, I did it. I just bought myself a car, a Honda, you know, a Honda Prelude, red. Ooh, I'm so, I'm so successful. <laughs> Um, and then something would happen. And then that's where the passion or drive kicked in. And my passion or drive or motivation actually came from um, discouragement. So if, if others found that I couldn't do it, or if I didn't qualify, or I didn't get the job, I kicked, I kicked in because, and that drive, you know, has to, I find that the biggest drive is self-motivated, Right. It didn't matter what mom or dad says to you. It didn't matter what the neighbor says to you. They're all helpful. But at the end of the day, whatever your drive is, and my drive was if I didn't get it, if there was, I got it, great. I relaxed. And, um, uh, you know, a, an example is uh, before I got that position as a as CEO of that, of Synthang, we were in a board meeting. And as usual, and I say this all because it's all the times, right? At, at those times, you really had um, 
I was too young. I was the wrong color and I was female. Mm. And so of course, being the only one in that board meeting, I would, it was just my lucky day, put my best dress on just to be sitting in that room. That was, I had already arrived just the fact that I was sitting in that board meeting. But what had happened was um, they were going through, well, something happens to the that time president who's in, you know, it's the COO, something happens to that person. Well, I happened to make it like fourth or fifth on the list. And that's oh, not wow. real yeah. because pro- odds are you're not going to, it's not going to get to you, but yeah. Yeah. you know, let's, let's throw her in there. So I, I, even I thought that was a great thing, but the guy across from me snickered, mm. you know, and kind, kind of under his breath, it's like, you know, come on. What's oh, wow. she going to do? You yeah. know? Yeah. So I, I always, I always had a choice. And I find that when you have these forked in the roads, you, everybody's got a choice. I mean, I could go home and cry, you know, go kick the sand and then go just, you know, go in the fetal position and, and stay there for a day. But I was never like that. What mm. that did is uh, it took it from, wow, I'm fine. I, at that time, I just bought my first house for myself, wow. had two cars. <laughs> um, so I, I would have been just fine. But when he said that, I never said anything. I didn't cry. The next year, I was sitting in his seat. Wow. <laughs> wow. What happened to him? <laughs> I, just, I, <clears throat> I just took over his position. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And so that's how I, um, that's what motivates me is it wasn't him and it wasn't really, you know, I could get mad at a person or, but that's, I mean, that's, that was my position. And if I wanted a different position, it was up to me to change it. Yeah. And so, I, I think, I think in our culture today, I'm, I'm 41. You're a young man. I'm young, but then I look at people coming up after me who are in their 30s, early 30s or 20s, and just the mindset of of how they process and approach problem and overcoming obstacles. It's like, I hate to use this word, but there's a lack of grit that's going on, like to say, I'm going to overcome the challenges instead of just accept them. Mm -hmm. So when you face those, when you encountered those, that, that drive that said, you know what, I'm going to show you that I can do this. I'm going to overcome this. I'm not going to just go, whether it's be a victim or just look down at myself. How were you able to keep the clarity of, of how you viewed yourself when you have this input from outside people who I'm assuming some of them you respected, some of those you people you looked up to. And, and in those moments, whether it was demeaning or whether it was just uh, a lack of confidence. How did you keep the clarity of saying, no, I, I can do this. I am good enough. I can do your job. I can become the next level. How are you able to keep that when, you know, there comes a point where there's that breaking point for a lot of people and they just kind of say, well, I can just settle in. I can get comfortable. I've succeeded enough. I've done well enough. How, how were you able to, to do that? Or how can they do that? I think that uh, what worked for me is always having a standard for myself, Mm. Um, rising above all of that, above all of it, and keeping myself to a very, very high standard, not pointing the finger out, but pointing the finger in at myself. Wow. Uh, Because there are, you know, there are, it's really easy to get on the bandwagon of, you know, what's wrong with everybody, why it's their fault, why this, why, 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 why. And, um, you know, your, your position or where you're at just really won't, really won't change. And it really won't make an effect on others, at least not the effect that you want. Yeah. But I can get that effect if I rise above the other. So if I come across, um, now, there's, and there's a, rising above it, having confidence. And there's a line because there's a line of confidence. And then there's a fine line between being a jerk too. You know, you you want to have good confidence, you know, you don't, you don't want to be a jerk. Um, And that confidence is really serving yourself, not, uh, not being, you know, looked on higher from yourself to others. That's that now starts being the jerk side. Um, so having rising above it, you know, having that, 
having that sort of confidence. And then if I ran into anything that I thought, then I think it's how I approached it. Yeah. So let's just make up a scenario. You know, somebody across from me is, um, is doing all the things it's probably not right to do. You know, if they're discriminating or they think women can't do anything or think they're too young or they think you're whatever it is, right. There's so many different types of, I don't, I take that and I don't look at the person and think, oh, what's, what's wrong and get angry. And I actually take an approach of, oh, I'm so happy I came across you. Yeah. This is my opportunity to really expand your library and, you know, see you, see you talk to a female who is hopefully, you know, betrayed as intelligent and Mm -hmm. kind and confident and can do business. And, you know, this, um, sometimes just a lot of people, you just have to, if you take it as an opportunity to expand their library, now you've really given something to them. What they do with that is theirs. Yeah. Yeah. But what I'm going to do with my time with you is not going to be anything, you know, negative, or I'm going to do something that I think is good for you and that you'll, and that you'll take it in a way that you want to accept it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think is good for those behind me because the next female or whoever that you're, you're going to say, oh, you're just going to have a different, you know, library and a different experience. And I'm so glad to be that experience. We're going to take a break right here. And in a moment, we'll be back to continue today's conversation with Twyla True. I wasn't joking when I said we have some great shows lined up. I wanted to give you a little taste of a couple new episodes that are coming up and tell you a little bit about the guests that we have showing up on the show. In our next episode, we have Emily Darchak, founder and CEO of Wayward Spirit. They are a truly innovative food company doing amazing things. They have a partnership with Ben & Jerry's to bring back the Dublin Mudslide. They're a food finalist in Fast Company's World Changing Idea Awards from 2021. There is a lot of cool stuff going on at their company creating really good tasty food. And then the episode after that is with Mark Hentman. He's an executive producer and showrunner from Family Guy. He's also one of the former writers for The Late Show with David Letterman. That gets me excited because Letterman's one of my favorite late night shows of all time. And then after that, our guest is Scott Hershevitz. He's a professor of law and philosophy at the University of Michigan and has this really, really cool book called Nasty, Brutish, and Short Adventures in Philosophy with My Kids. We've got some jam-packed, exciting episodes that really explore amazing ideas and how you can even be more creative in your own life. So don't miss any of those episodes. If you haven't already, go subscribe to the show. And uh, next week, you're going to hear some great conversations. I don't want you to miss a thing. Now let's jump back into today's conversation. I think it's easy to ride those different places and get to the extremes, whether it's overconfidence or uh, self-deprecation or, but finding that balance between confidence and humility and doing it well, where, where you're saying, I can only be responsible for myself. I can only do what I can do. And I can offer that as an opportunity to, for someone else. And, and I love that. I've never thought of that as here's what I'm bringing to the table. Now, this is your opportunity to change your perspective in that and inviting mm-hmm. them into that conversation. I think that's a really powerful tool, no matter who you are, but especially if, if you're coming from a perspective where somebody might have a reason to look down on you. Yes. Yeah. You know, it's been, um, I think that's a, that is a lost thing that if people understood, you know, just imagining themselves. And I do do a lot of, I do do a lot of imagining or, you know, as they say, thinking of what it is that I want and, you know, those things really happening. And even with people or personalities and, you know, we can all sort of imagine uh, a person who's not nice walks in the door and has the wrong approach, the wrong attitude, the wrong, and they lean in and they're, they have a gruff, you know, um, if I never lowered to his or her level, he knows it. She, she knows it. They know it. They almost get embarrassed. 
if, and then you can turn them to your level of sophistication and respectfulness and by never letting them kink your armor yeah. Yeah. of respect. And, um, and then when, like I said, they, you actually will kind of see them, you know, get embarrassed by it. And yeah. so you don't have to hit them with the, over the head of, cause if you hit them over the head and say, Oh, you're being such a jerk it, Oh, he's just going to be more of a jerk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, you want to give them that out of revelation without mm-hmm. like embarrassment. You want to give yes. them an opportunity to like an off ramp on like, hey, I'm going down this way. There's the highway I should be on. Let me go over here. And you're, and you're giving them an opportunity through that relationship. Yes. Yes. And even at the height of it, I will not engage. Even if I can see a person who very few does that ever happen because most people um, approach something and even sometimes they need a mirror of reflection to say, Oh, you know, and they'll change their, like I said, they'll hit embarrassment and then you'll see them change to also, and you also now have shown that you're of a higher place because you're so dignified and kind and respectful and smart. Um, now, of those very few opportunities that it doesn't that it doesn't happen, you know, then even even then with grace and dignity, because I've never lost mine, yeah. I will, you know, hope them a really nice day and that it, how what a nice, you know, how pleasurable it was to to meet them. And I hope to see them really soon. You know, that if you always maintain it, then your your armor stays strong. Yeah. I, uh, I want to pivot and make sure we talk a little bit about some of the cool things that you are working on and building volume ventures. I don't know how I never heard about this, uh, until I heard about you. This is such a cool business doing some unique things. Tell us about that and kind of the advent, the idea behind it. So volume ventures, I'm in a really lucky place now, as I said, you know, before I probably had to deal with people I didn't want to, do a lot of things that I, I knew I needed to do in uh, business types of types of business or things that weren't interesting. In my later years, uh, I was successful enough that I got I get to pick and choose my projects. So I pick and choose good people, um, interesting things, and things that you know might make a difference for those in the future. Yeah. So I met these two guys, James Fontleroy and Rand Stopson in Inglewood. Uh, about six, eight years ago, um, someone says, you know, you got to go meet them. So I went and met them um, at a small little tiny studio in Inglewood. Uh, And this is, I got to set the picture for you, right? This is me showing up in my red Ferrari, exiting Inglewood in a shack of a studio, uh, two guys who happen to be Mm -hmm. African-American, and uh, go in, go in. So, you know, that sort of sets the picture of, you know, today um, in my, in my shoes, carrying my bag, you know, walking in my high heels in, in this setting. (laughs) So on the outside, you know, everybody would see the outside, but on the inside, um, that none of that matters because what does matter is, they are good people. I'm good people. Um, good people like working with good people. Right. Good business that makes good business doesn't matter. Uh, and then you put good that makes a good business. You put good people around it. Um, you know that all approach things the right way, and uh, it now you got a winner. Yeah. So what does uh, Volume Ventures do? What do you provide? How do you serve the community of of creators in that space? So Volume Ventures is is an entertainment complex. Our first one is in Englewood, California. It's got about three studios, live room, green room, um, podcast. It also has um, event space outside. And then 20% of it, it's a building about 26, 28,000 square feet. Uh, The other 20% is 1500 Sound Academy. Oh, cool. So when they met there, um, they were working at a gospel church. I think they were like eight and 10, 10 and 12. I forget. They were in a band working the church and somebody who discovered them came up and said, hey, how much for you guys to play in my band? And they walked over in the corner, talked about it, came back to the guy and said, 1500 or nothing. 
Wow. So that's how the name of their band, 1500, came about. Okay. So they have written and produced for, when I say written and produced, uh, that means they did one or the other or both. Um, Jay-Z, Justin Timberlake's last three albums, Bruno Mars' last three albums, uh, Sweetie, um, Snoo, uh, Rihanna, Beyonce. I mean, the list just goes on. So I met them and I thought, wow, these are these are great guys doing great things. Yeah. What is it that we can do together? So really, we just took their um, the work that they do and created a platform around that. So now we're building uh, about 13 of these studios. Uh, first one's in Englewood, another 12 in Asia, then I'm building another one in, in Vegas over the next six months. And then uh, the studios. And I got to spend just a second on these studios because we talked about my history yeah. and that's, we were, that's where we had kinship. So they're born and bred Inglewood. They wanted to create six month certificate courses in music, how to write, how to produce um, songwriting, all these publishing contracts. And so when we were first thinking about it, them and a group of their friends took me all around to all these schools, music schools. And I said, well, that was fun. What did we do this for? And they said, well, ask us. And there was probably about six or eight very accomplished um, talent, you know, all very accomplished people. They said, well, ask us, Twyla, how many of us graduated formal, any sort of formal education? Right. And not right. one. Right. Half of them graduated high school. Right. <laughs> <laughs> So we opened up uh, 1500 or nothing sound Academy. Cause I think that, um, you know, there's for those who have the opportunity for formal education, it's wonderful. It's such a great thing. And for those who don't, um, it doesn't mean that they're not capable. It just means that you, you still need an opportunity of where to get some sort of uh, education on how to get there. Yeah. And I love this because for me, I think that we're in a unique time in history where we're getting the opportunity to rethink how we approach learning and teaching with whether it's technology or whether it's programs that are really hyper-focused on the skill sets that we need. That's that's like your story when you're talking about, I'm going back to accounting uh, to a night school to learn about this. You didn't go and say, I'm going to go get my MBA as a starting place. You said, this is the skill I need. And you yeah. created a way to get that skill so that it could help you broaden the, the knowledge that you had to operate from. And I think a lot of people forget that there's power in being focused at figuring out the skills and the things you need at that moment. And then along the way, get the education. And, and I love that about 1500 Sounds Academy mm -hmm. is that you're uh, and, and the guys there are, are rethinking, how do we approach teaching this? How do we make it more accessible to these creators who have a lot of talent and have a lot of abilities, but they don't have industry knowledge or, or understanding of how it all works. And so I love this. I think it's such a cool, cool organization, such a cool uh, business. Thank you. Yeah. Education is, has certainly changed, right? And um, it's been changing over the years, but COVID definitely threw it over the edge really fast. Yeah. Um, you know, you had a lot of higher education and it was really sort of a, uh, this, it was stamped out this is what you do. You know, yeah. you go to high school, you go to college. I mean, if you were crazy, the crazy people did a gap year. That was like as crazy as you got. And then you do an internship and then you get locked in the cubicle forever. You know, that's, yeah. that's kind of the road. And um, I love that COVID almost ugh, tons of terrible things, but, and like anything that shakes up things, they shake them up. And what happened is COVID popped that lid to say, you know, um, we, there's all kinds of ways to learn. Uh, we figured out technology and, and Zooming. Um, you know, there's just not traditional learning. And then you got the millennials behind that. And, um, you know, the way they like to learn is, is a lot of fun. I, I love it. You know, I'm, I must be a closet millennial because that's... <laughs> I loved to be able to learn and apply, learn and apply, and then sometimes do things that you would never apply, but it just, uh, you know, opens up how, how you think of things. Yeah, I was one of those weird kids that I took a gap year uh, yeah. and uh, and it wasn't. Uh, 
it was accidental, to be honest. I, I had planned to go to a college and then felt like it wasn't the right place. And so I took a year to figure out where the right place was. Went to the college halfway through uh, studying, was offered a job from one of my professors going to work with him, uh, doing what I want to do uh, in Houston. So I said, okay, I'll go along for this ride. And here I'm 41, just going back to finish some of the degree stuff that I wanted to learn and taking the classes I want to learn about because I'm interested in them or there are things that benefit to the direction of, of where I feel like I'm going with my businesses or what whatnot. And I think, I think it's really important. I mean, it's part of your story that we don't put shame on people on that, but we really enable them with the right skills and giftings and uh, not the giftings, but uh, encourage their giftings along the journey and really help them get into the place where they can thrive. And it sounds like for you, that journey allowed you to thrive in a way that if you probably would have tried to go to college right away, you wouldn't have gotten to where you are today. I think so. And I love what you're saying, uh, because I think that um, life, uh, a lifetime learner is a wonderful, wonderful thing, you know, just because you, you rocket ship out of high school and then rocket ship through college and then, you know, call it, call it done. And, you know, uh, I think it's a nice long life. Yeah. And the more we want to, um, you know, cocoon and change and if we're comfortable and we like the, we like, you know, the same, and that's what, that is fantastic. But for those of us who want to change a couple times, um, you know, change quite a bit and, and learn. Actually, I think, you know, for me, I think that that's fun. I think that that's interesting. You know, I hope to live to 90 and still be, still be learning, still taking some, you know, odd course somewhere in poetry and, you know, applying it on a mountaintop. Yeah, I love that because for me, I, I see these people that talk about retirement. And I'm sure there's one day where I'll slow down, but I just can't see that being appealing to me. It just sounds very, very boring, you know? And so yeah. I love that about your story. Uh, we're running out of time. There's lots of things you're doing True Family Enterprises, True Late Homes, uh, Twyla True Fine Jewelry, which is super beautiful jewelry. It's amazing stuff that you're creating there. Uh, Twyla True Collaborations. How can people find and learn more about what you're doing, connect with the different things that you're building, learn from your journey? What, what are the best ways to connect and, and see all of your empire for that, uh, what you've built? Thank you. Uh, the best way right now is, interesting enough, uh, Instagram. So, you know, just go to Instagram and, and DM me. And I, I love talking to people. Uh, I work with lots of people and inter- anything that's synergistic, um, you know, I love uh, sharing or teaching or so, yeah, DM me. And that's probably the best way to get a hold of me. And I was on your Instagram earlier this week, and I have to say there are a lot of fun posts, a lot of, I, 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 lack of a better way, behind the scenes kind of moments where you get to see what your life really is like. I think sometimes we glamorize things, but you, you give an honest kind of peek behind it. And I really appreciated that about the posts I saw you post. No, oh, thank you so much. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I work probably 60, 70, 60 hours a, a week. Um, and so what time I do have, I guess that would be my takeaway, even learning it for myself is I'm very, um, I'm, I'm very knowledgeable of my time and where I'm applying my time. So work is work is a thousand percent when I'm in it. And when it's personal and I'm off, you know, I'm, I'm with my family. I love that. We're going to take a break right here. And when we come back, it is Rapid Fire Questions with Twyla True. Now let's return to today's conversation with Twyla True for rapid fire questions. Pour mettre l'aiguille sur le disque, mettez le contact, reposez votre bras. Let's dive into some rapid fire questions. Yes. The first one, as a child, what did you want to be when you grew up? I wanted to be a powwow dancer. Wow. That's really <laughs> quite cool, actually. Do you did you ever do powwow dancing? I did later in my 
in my later years, as does my two daughters. Wow, that's really cool. And you're passing that heritage on to your kids, which is such a gift. I think that we all are longing to know about where we come from. And so being able to pass that on must be just such a gift. It's a, it's a special thing to um, always have that to go to. What is one tip you give someone with a big idea or dream and they don't know where to start? Uh, no, it's a big idea and it's okay. You just, you really have to take it one spoon, one spoon at a time. And once you start, then you started, but it's, it's really just starting and don't be afraid if the dream changes. What is one change you'd like to see in the world? I would love, I would love to see, um, more, I would love to see more acceptance mm. and um, open-mindedness in the world. And I think that if we all approached it like that, because it would be pretty boring if we all spoke the same language, yeah. were the same gender, you know, same color, and all thought the exact same way. I think, I think having things wide makes it an interesting world. Yeah. What do you want your legacy to be? I want my legacy to be that uh, as a, probably as a, as a female, I want my legacy to be as a female. Um, I walked life through all its hurdles and kept, uh, kept my dignity yeah. and uh, was a lifetime learner. What is one book you think every dreamer should read? That one I don't have for you yet. Maybe you're going to inspire me to write a book. I'd love that. And you have to come back on to share about the book once it's written. Yes. <laughs> How do you personally define success? Not monetary. Mm -hmm. I think that um, that's the biggest mistake. Yeah. I think that, again, it's, it's how you walked this life and how you made people feel yeah. when you walked out of the room, yeah. how they I, remember you. I love that. You are on the pulse of so many different things. What is one trend you are excited about? I'm very excited about uh, how how um, consumer goods is coming into the market, yeah. how we're buying, how we're marketing, how we're, I think that we, we understand it's different and it's changed, but I think it's evolving yeah. so fast right now. Um, so uh, technology and consumer goods, I think are, are highly interesting. And I say that because that always gives newcomers a chance to come in. Yeah. Yeah, it really does. Yeah. So if you look at music, if you look at uh, a few of the things I'm I'm in, right? If you look at music, I came in because uh, Spotify and you know came in and changed the game that allowed me to to say, okay, this is there's a change. Um, when you look at consumer goods and some of the things we're doing, well, the way social media and the way uh, technology changed everything. Well, it's not just the department stores and the magazines any longer. Right. You, you, right. you can get in. So um, I, I love change. Don't look at change as scary. Look at it as an, uh, you know, as a uh, way to an opportunity. Love that. Our final rapid fire question. What is one dream you're still wanting to fulfill in your own life? It sounds going to gonna sound create pretty boring based on what I do, but I'd like to create more businesses and or see businesses grow for those who, who didn't think it was an option. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Mm -hmm. Twyla, thank you so much for taking time out. I know you've got a billion things going on, so it's been an honor to have you on and to hear your perspectives. And, you know, my big takeaway today is simple, you know, pay attention to the people in front of you and give them opportunities to see the world differently through your interactions. And I think that's a valuable lesson for all of us. So thank you so much for sharing your story, sharing your insights and giving us a little encouragement on our, our journey of ideas and dreams. Thank you, thank you. Once again, I wanna thank our guest today, Twyla True, for joining us here on JumbleThink. You can find her links in the episode notes. Definitely go check out what she's doing. Check out that Instagram feed. It's a lot of fun. And Twyla and her team is creating amazing things. Next show, we have an amazing guest, Emily Darchek, who is the founder and CEO of Wayward Spirit. It's going to be a really fun conversation. Make sure to check that out. 
I want to encourage you as we wrap up today's conversation, no matter if you come from great means or low means, you have the means to chase your dreams. And what I mean by that is very simple. It doesn't matter where you come from. What it matters is, is what will you do with what you have? Whether it's a little or a lot, you can turn that into bigger things and even bigger things and begin to see amazing dreams that you couldn't imagine when you first set out on the journey becoming reality. And so that's my challenge to you today. No matter what's going on in your life, no matter how good or bad or how much or how little you have, take some steps today to challenge what might be possible in your mind, what you may think is realistic and begin to turn those those ideas, those dreams, those visions of the future into reality. You don't have to start big, just take a small step. So get out there, dream big, and change the world around you. En avant, en arrière, sur les côtés. Vous êtes une autre personne. Les mères de famille, les enfants peuvent également prendre un moment revitalisant dans quelques mois. Lorsque vous aurez bien saisi la technique et que vous serez maître de votre corps, vous pourrez vous décontracter même en travaillant.